Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome or welcome back, of course, to the Laurie Milton Lecture Series with the Milton Public Library. It's getting lighter out. The sun is staying out longer and the temperature is rising. I hope that everyone who is able is spending some time outside or booking some time outside for the near future. I have some small notes to share ahead of getting started this evening. We do have time carved out for questions. I know that's been a favorite part of these lectures. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom right of your screen. And we have someone tracking questions for you. The lecture is being recorded and we will be sharing that lecture uh, with you all post event. My name is Carolyn Hawthorne and I work for Wilfrid Laurier University. I am so proud of this partnership with the Milton Public Library. The Laurier Milton Lecture Series provides a wonderful opportunity to engage in public dialogue with the citizens of Milton and beyond on a broad array of important topics. Presentations represent the current research and analysis from different faculties, departments, and programs, all at Laurier. Tonight's lecture is also one of our last of the series. We started in September and our last lecture will be in May. So we hope to see you back uh, for our next uh, coming lectures and uh, provide us with some, with some feedback for our next series. Before we begin the program tonight, we would like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the Haldeman Track, traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples and symbolizes the agreement to share and protect our resources and not engage in conflict. The treaty was signed by the British with their allies, the Six Nations, after the American Revolution. Despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory after losing much of the territory to settlement of newcomers. Perhaps you're joining us from a different location this evening. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the land where you reside. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and water. This evening, I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Miguel Siwi. Miguel is an Indigenous geographer and environmental management scholar deeply rooted in his Huron-Wendat traditions and community. Miguel shares that he sees his purpose as a cultural translator between two worlds, Western and Indigenous, that have historically struggled to meaningful communicate. Miguel is keenly aware of the need for deeper reconciliation between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous intellectual communities through the creation of mutual usable channels of communication and research collaboration. Miguel's growing interest in Indigenous environmental management compelled Dr. Siwi to pursue a master's in geography at the University of Ottawa. His master's research further augmented his interest in Indigenous land-based philosophies that led him to choose to pursue a doctoral, doctoral research at Carleton University. And that was on current Mayan land use and management knowledges in Yucatan, Mexico. Relying on interviews and participant observation, his doctoral research sought to document, interpret, elaborate, and synthesize of the current state of the Yucatec Maya land use knowledges of a Mayan community and describe how they are understood and put into practice on the land by its members. And tonight, Miguel will share with the audience some insights into the deeply Canadian Huron Wendat philosophy and circular thinking approach, as well as perspectives on how all Canadians can learn or relearn how to be a part of our land, our Earth Mother, on which we live and depend. Thank you so much, Dr. Siwi, for your time, your energy, and your knowledge this evening. I pass it off to you. Thank you, Carolyn, and uh, your whole team. It's uh, really an honor and a privilege for me to be here and to be able to share my most cherished one that values and uh, and and traditional knowledges as well. So it's it's quite an honor and privilege. And uh, I want to say, kwe awati onehon. So welcome and greetings to all my relatives. And uh, I'm going to begin my presentation now. So thanks again.
Okay, is that visible to everyone? I'm not hearing anything, so. <laughs> um. Am I? Okay, people are saying they can see. Okay, I'll start. Sorry about that. I'll start that over again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So I think everyone should be able to see that. So the title of my lecture, my talk tonight is Recovering Our Deeply Canadian Indigenous Heritage, Learning to Belong to Our Yatenoha, which is the Wandat word for our Earth Mother, to which we all belong, all human peoples and all other than being, other, other than human beings as well. And so it's, again, an honor and a privilege for me to be here and to be able to share some ideas with you. And like I said, some of my most cherished Wandat traditions and knowledges um, of which I'm an inheritor through a, a very long-standing tradition in this part of the world in Southern Ontario, which was our traditional homeland, the Huron Wandat people. So before I get started and before I begin to share some ideas with you, I want to situate myself as a Wandat thinker and as an academic and um, also situate myself within my family history and my broader cultural history as well. So before our harsh experience with colonialism, our nation, like all Indigenous nations in Canada, is uh, in, general, in general terms made up of two types of people and families. So there's those who are keenly interested in history and ancestral values, and others who are not so strongly interested in these aspects of identity. The first are often called traditionalists and the second progressives, if you will. I come from a very traditionalist family. Our way of thinking and living was characterized by a very close connection to the land and a very high respect for our Wandat ancestors. In our family ran and still runs the knowledge about plants and our traditional earth medicine as well. Our home life was also marked by a strong interest in our history and specifically, um, sorry, history, and specifically by a pervasive and shared desire to rewrite our history from the Wandat perspective. For the most part, my family has preserved a vivid consciousness that our Wandat people and all our Indigenous nations globally have been and continued to be the victims of a false and forged non-Indigenous historiography told and written about us a historiography which taught and repeated in schools and in the Can Canadian public media over many generations has rendered most of the Canadian citizenry unable to look at us as people worthy of respect and uh, as all other people, and therefore as entitled as all other people to live freely, happily, and healthy in an inclusive and evolved society. As is quite often the lot of traditional Indigenous people, we a proud traditional Wandat family suffered sharply and directly from the uh, effects of the cruel racist legacy which Canadian historiography about the Indigenous Canadian people was dealt to all Canadian citizens in all Canadian schools. So yes, as a consequence of that kind of national so-called education about Indians, we as a family were marginalized and in past generations poor and afflicted by alcoholism, uh, dysfunctional, but all in all, very proud and thankful to the great spirit of life that we were one that, and that we were, that we were Indian. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about some, some uh, prominent figures in my family, and <laughs> it's hard for me not to get emotional when I talk about these people because they shape the way that I think, and. Um, so I owe all honor and respect to these people, including Michelle Tsiwi, who was a, a chief of peace and war and wampum keeper for our nation in the early 1800s. Uh, another shining role model for me and for all of our people is Dr. Eleanor Siwi, the late Dr. Eleanor Siwi, who was officer of uh, the Order of Canada and the first Indigenous woman in Canada to obtain a PhD. 
And George Siwi, my, my father, was the first Canadian First Nations PhD in history graduate and a very influential Wandat thinker and philosopher. So it's to them that I owe all my gratitude and my thanks um, for being able to share all of these ideas with you today. So thank you for bearing with me. It's always a, a very, very emotional when I talk about my people and uh, my family, my ancestors as well. So I have this duty and responsibility to honor our longstanding one that intellectual, philosophical and spiritual tradition, not only for the benefit of the one that people and other indigenous peoples across Canada, but for all who are part of our great circle of peoples on our Yatenoha, which unites us all as people, you know, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. And so this way of thinking clearly has influenced my current research on Indigenous environmental stewardship as a geographer and as an environmental management and uh, environmental studies scholar. Uh, here you can see on the top left a photo from my field research in the Yucatan with a Maya Milpero and knowledge holder. And so I developed very strong relationships within Maya communities in the Yucatan, as well as all the other communities in which I do research and I relate with the land and the people there. And I owe that to circular thinking and this Huron Wandat tradition, you know, uh, spiritual and tradition and political philosophy as well, which I'll describe a bit later on. So let me talk about the, the Wandat people and Confederacy. So my people, first and foremost, you could say, are a people of diplomacy, peace, and alliance making. Uh, I carry the name Sastaretsi, which means the one who extends the rafters of the longhouse. Uh, it was designated to chiefs who were the chiefs of all chiefs, meaning the chief of one's clan, uh, of one's nation, and also the great Wandat Confederacy. And you can see some maps on the right-hand side of where our traditional territory, our Wandake, our heartland, uh, was located, at least historically, between Lake Ontario and Georgian Bay. So really not too far from where I live and work in uh, Kitchener, Ontario. And so my people are the descendants of the Wandat. The name Huron, which means uncouth or ill-mannered, was disparagingly put on us by the French and has served to justify uh, the negation of our dignity as a people, and simultaneously the taking of our land and other property. At the time of the arrival of Europeans, our Wandat people were one of North America's most important indigenous confederacies. Similar to the Haudenosaunee, ours was made up of five nations as well, that you can see in the uh, middle map there on this slide. So there were the people of the Bear, uh, the people of the Lying Rock, the people of the Cord, the people of the deer, and also the people of the marsh or bog. The Wandat civilization and Wandat confederacy was at the center of a very extensive trading network and a great number of other nations in, East, in Northeastern North America utilized our language for trade and diplomacy. So the Wandat confederacy was very powerful and remarkably prosperous. The Wandat were at the heart of the indigenous geopolitics of this vast, beautiful region, which eventually gave Canada its spirit and its name, Kanata. From a population of more than 30,000 in our Wandake at the time of European arrival, only a few thousand survived the shock of very severe epidemics and a period of intense warfare between the French and the British over the control of North America, often instigated through the meddling of Catholic missionaries. Of these few thousand, about 400 made their way to the vicinity of Quebec City, where some of their ancestral populations had once lived until they were dispersed from those parts following the voyages of Jacques Cartier, the so-called discoverer of Canada and of many other French adventurers and seekers of the fabled road to the Indies. There, near present-day Quebec City, New France's authorities created a reserve for the settlement and conversion of the savages, or my ancestors. There's a few very notable figures in Wandat history, and I should say that's where our community and reserve is located to this day, near Quebec City, because of this colonial geography and colonial power struggle for the control of North America between the French and the British. So we had very 
notable peacemakers and diplomats. We are a people of diplomats of peace and of alliance making. Like I said, we are the Sastarezzi, the ones who extend the rafters of the longhouse and the ones who extend the circle to all others. And so probably the most notable of these peacemakers was the great peacemaker, uh, who was a one dot visionary, one dot by birth, and then Haudenosaunee by adoption, and the founder of the Haudenosaunee through the great law of peace. He was named the great peacemaker by the Haudenosaunee. Also a lesser known figure, but equally eminent in my estimation, is the great Huron chief or one dot chief, Condi Aronc. He was an eminent Sastarezzi born in the 1620s and who died in 1701. So I should make a note about the French and Indian wars in the 1600s and the reason why the Great Peace of Montreal was so significant at the time. In 1609, the French, who were allies of the Wandat, waged war against the Haudenosaunee and uh, this resulted in decades of warfare and chaos and upheaval in all indigenous affairs and politics and life ways in present day Southern Ontario and in this part of North America, really. So Condi Aronc was the great visionary and organizer of the great peace of Montreal in 1701. He brought with him a message of peace and alliance making and also the time honored one dot tradition of, of diplomacy and so he convened representatives from 38 nations, including the five Haudenosaunee nations, as well as the French, and as many as 1,000 chiefs from all of these nations, from the whole Northeast, as far south as the Mississippi, as far north as James Bay, as far west as the uh, Winnebago in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and um, as far east as the Maritime, peoples like the Maliseet and the Mi'kmaq as well. So elderly and frail, by the time this gathering uh, took place, Condi Aronc attended the great gathering, but died two days before the signing of the Great Peace of Montreal in 1701. And so during an address, a final address really, before the, the, the formal signing of this document of this great peace, uh, he, Condi Aronc addressed all of the nations and all of the delegates and representatives that were there. So he was a, a masterful orator by all accounts, and he gave an impassioned and really a sublime two-hour speech to all those assembled, which made many cry you know, by, by different accounts about the history of this event, including his longtime Haudenosaunee enemies who were traditionally allied to the Dutch first and then the English. So the French held a burial ceremony for Condi Aronc, and it was his longtime Haudenosaunee adversaries who carried him and took him to his final resting place. So that goes to show you the power of one dot peace making and diplomacy and alliance building you know the, the fact that he was able to assemble all of these nations from across eastern north america in one gathering place to sign such a historic uh, treaty between all of these nations and the french so uh, just to give you some examples of this time honored one dot tradition of diplomacy and peacemaking and so that's still uh, what informs my work and my outlook on life, you know, and my research as well. So that's why I'm mentioning all of this. So really, it's all about harmonious relationships with our neighbors and also a vast trading network throughout Eastern North America. So here you can see the extent of this trading network, uh, this network of goodwill and peace that was created and established through the leadership and governance of the one that uh, civilization, the Wandat Confederacy. Through many centuries, the Wandat established this vast and intricate network of trade and interrelationships on our Yatenoha, as you can see here, sharing goodwill and helping to create prosperity and peace among all the nations of Turtle Island. All roads led to Wandake. It was a centerland and a heartland for many nations on Turtle Island. Wandat was the lingua franca for trade and for diplomacy and for relationships. All the nations within our, our trading networks adopted Wandat as a second language because it was necessary to learn it in order to benefit from the prosperity and the networks of peaceful relationships that had been established between so many nations as a result of the Wandat's circular and trade-oriented inclusive view on diplomacy and politics. The most precious objects and goods in existence on Turtle Island all passed through our Wandake, our homeland. 
one decade one was one of the major international hubs in North America prior to the arrival of the Europeans. So it was our vision and goal of extending the rafters of our longhouse and building alliances with our neighboring nations that inspired this multi-generational project, if you could put it that way, and really a truly amazing exercise in diplomacy, in political philosophy, and circular thinking. A vision that one that traditional one that people believe the world can draw inspiration and guidance from at the current time, which is mired in division and warfare, or at least conflicts between different groups, and also an inability to meaning, meaningfully communi communicate and interrelate. Another thing that few people are aware of, few people who live in, and work and, um, and relate with one another on, uh, on the territories, the traditional territories of the Wandat and other Iroquoian societies in Southern Ontario, is that the Wandat and other Iroquoian societies were really provided the world with its first true democratic models of government and also free government. So the Wandat and other Iroquoian societies in present day Southern Ontario and New York State had very sophisticated democratic and political models. For example, the Wandat and Haudenosaunee confederacies later on. This is a democracy that is a more complete and true democracy than what we have currently in place in our Western democratic models in societies like Canada. There is an inclusion of other than human beings in the democratic process, as well as a recognition that women should occupy uh, uh, their rightful role at the center of the circle. And I'll get into the concept of matricentrism a bit later. So of course, like all indigenous peoples, the Wandat have had to deal with the colonial power struggle for territory, for land, uh, and for power and influence in the Americas. So the Americas until 1492 were completely disconnected and isolated from the rest of the known world, which meant most of Europe and parts of Asia and Africa. There was here on this continent in the Ameri on the American soil, a widespread exchange of ideas and material objects that had for millennia uh, been exchanged between the different peoples, the different indigenous civilizations in the Americas. And so that's why on this continent, there's such a wealth of knowledges and political systems and ways of knowing and living that are all rooted in a common land-based tradition and philosophy that are very different from old world models. So indigenous peoples across the Americas share a common colonial experience as well with different European powers, whether it's in the case of the Wandat with the French or the Haudenosaunee with the British or the Maya with the Spanish in the Yucatan. You know, we've all had to deal with different uh, colonial powers and the complete upheaval and turmoil that that, that, that that has caused all of our cultures and civilizations. So of course, I'm sure you're all aware that these colonial practices and attitudes continue to this day, even in the so-called post-colonial context, right? So that's uh, another point of discussion for us today. Now, I have to tell you that government and democratic models in the old world were far from free or far from democratic, really, when uh, we analyze how people were living back in those times in Europe. There were few, if any, democratic models for government or governance. And until 1492, until the, the first Europeans arrived in the American continent and were exposed to true freedom and true democracies, here that we enjoyed in our societies, like the Wandat Confederacy. Uh, this led to a complete revolution in the way of thinking of the European peoples who were exposed to this newfound freedom. So there's a quote from Jack Weatherford, who is a very influential U.S. historian, uh, who wrote a very a great book, really, in my opinion, uh, The Indian Giver. And so here he's talking about government and democratic models in the old world. So he writes... The old world gave few democratic models for government. Democratic government had no fortress in the old world. Despite the democratic rhetoric that came into fashion in 18th century Europe, no such systems existed there at the time. France has not, had not yet begun its experiments with participatory democracy. So in fashioning the new system, which was American democracy, the founding fathers of America 
borrowed some very distinctive elements from the American Indians, namely civilizations like the Wandat and the Haudenosaunee, who were culturally and linguistically related. So in these kinds of societies, people were exposed to or, or living really under the thumb of autocratic rulers and monarchs, you know, kings and queens. And so freedom was something that uh, really was almost unfathomable by the average person living under the rule of these, uh, these kings and queens and monarchs. So the first European settlers who arrived on the shore of this continent knew very, very little about democracy and freedom, having fled the talons of imperialistic society in Europe. And so an example that uh, might be useful in, in terms of letting you understand and see how strange it was to relate with people coming from this distant land, talking about their, their models of democracy and governance uh, in their countries, like the French. Uh, one that men in their first encounters with Catholic missionaries and priests and other colonial agents, they really didn't understand how these people lived back home in France, you know? So the, for the vast majority of men, of, of the French men that the, uh, because I mean, the first colonial agents were invariably men, uh, but the one that men living in these free societies did not consider the vast majority of French men to be free thinking human beings or otherwise men, you know? And so they did not, they did not see how someone could serve a master like a king or a queen or a, a colonial agent that was higher up. That kind of way of thinking was really uh, very difficult to understand to the one that mind. And so they considered the behavior of French people and especially the, uh, the people representing Catholic orders in the new world, they really considered their behavior to be more akin to that of a dog who serves its master and not a free thinking human living in a free society. So I use that example not to disparage the French uh, or European people for that matter. It's just to show you that it was a, a completely different worldview and understanding about uh, relationships with the land and relationships with other people uh, that you know was brought to bear here in the Americas and in the case of my own people, the Huron Wandat. So it was very strange to see people living in servitude to a so-called superior or Lord or even their God. Now let's come back to the idea of matricentrism, which is, was an, an idea developed by uh, my, my father, Dr. George Siwi, or rather a coin termed by George Siwi. Matricentrism is quite simple. It means matri, meaning mothers, are at the center of society because that's how one that society operated. That's how one that people imagined that a normally functioning society should operate really with women and mothers at the center. Uh, this is in contrast to patriarchal orders and societies that have become widespread around the world today. And so Yatenoha is the one, the one that word that means earth mother. So there's a responsibility to our Yatenoha, just like there's a responsibility to our biological mother. We relate with the land in these familial terms, like in my case, between a son and his mother. We don't have a right to exploit natural resources or to exploit our earth mother, right? It doesn't even make sense when you think about it to exploit our own mother. There's very few normal and sane people who would be able to do that, right? So it's, rather we have a responsibility to our Yatenoha, our Earth Mother. So matricentrism uh, relates to restoring and reestablishing the natural order of things and a recognition that women are designed to occupy the central place in their group or their community and are meant to have positions of influence and power just as men. There's complementarity between sexes and also different gender identities. I'm not uh, limiting the discussion to just men and women. You know, there's other gender identities that are included in this model and in this definition as well. There's also the notion that women are our first environment. So women are, you know, our biological, meaning our biological mother and our mother is our first environment because we, we all start our life inside of our mother's womb. 
So why is our biological mother not our first mother in the mind of the one that person? It's because you and I do not share the same biological mother, but we do share the same Yatenoha, our earth mother, and therefore we consider our Yatenoha our first mother. So our biological mother is our first teacher, and she guides us and she cares for us, and she gives us our first education. But ultimately, our biological mother also belongs to Yatenoha, our earth mother. And that's why we consider the land and Yatenoha our first mother. So Yatenoha is our primary teacher throughout our lifetime as all human beings, really, one that and non one that people. That's how I'm able to relate with every one of you. It's through our Yatenoha and the knowledge that the earth is our common mother. And that's why we're all related. So we have a creation story of Atayin Sik, the sky woman. So according to the legend, at the time of creation in the sky world, as you can see in the, the middle image there, in the sky world, a tree broke and left a hole in the ground that led to the center of the earth. Atayin Sik fell from the sky and before falling into the hole left by this tree, she was carried down on the wings of geese. And so after her fall, the birds brought her down to the hole onto the water. A giant turtle then emerged from the underground waters and carried her to the surface. Atayin Sik needed soil in order to survive and to establish the new society on the back of the turtle. So the toad, according to Wandat tradition, the humblest of all the animals, was the, one, was the only one who was able to dive to the bottom of the primordial sea and collect a handful of earth and bring it back to the surface to be spread across the back of the turtle. So this tiny bit of earth was then spread on the back of the turtle and from it was created the land on which we all live, which is Turtle Island. So as you can see, a woman in this case, Atayin Sik, is a central figure in our mythology and in our spirituality and our cultural worldview. There's an innate respect uh, that is given to women or that is held for women in our societies because we know that women are the earth creators. Women, uh, a woman is the one who created life for all of us on the back of this turtle on Turtle Island. So this teaches us about the relationships between human beings and other than human peoples. Atayin Sik needed the geese in order to survive. They're the ones who caught her and broke her fall. And also the toad and the turtle who had central roles in this story. It's a much different creation story uh, from the one of Adam and Eve, you know, where there's this snake, a treacherous snake that duped the, the human beings, you know, the innocent and pure human beings into biting an apple. And then we all know the rest of the story, right? So it's a completely different relationship uh, between human beings and animals and the rest of creation. And that's what we learn as one that people, you know, and that's how we're able to see the world in such a way. So in one that society and culture, we have what we call circular thinking. There's a belief in the agency and self-awareness of other than human beings. This includes future generations and also past human generations. In addition to, of course, animals and plants, and even features of the landscape, right? Like mountains, lakes and rivers, the soil, our crops, the sky, all of this is part of the great circle of peoples on our Yatenoha. So there's a recognition that all beings, both human and other than human are interdependent. And so that's why we welcome all into our great circle. Really, it's a spiritual duty and responsibility for uh, the, the traditional one that thinker to see the world and to see interpersonal relationships in such a way. Other characteristics of one that knowledge is that it's passed down orally through the generations in contrast to most Western ways of knowing. Western ways of knowing or Western societies can be characterized as literate cultures and societies, whereas most indigenous peoples of at least this part of North America can be described as non-literate societies. And so this means a completely different perspective on time and space. You know, when you can trace your point of origin as a culture to a specific text, like the Bible, the Quran, or a philosophical document that was written 1,000 years ago, and you can trace the evolution of your culture to a specific date, and then moving forward to an undefined point B, 
you know, somewhere out there in space and in time, it yields a completely different outlook on time and space and progress and development, what we call a linear perspective on the world and on uh, societal development and progress, as I was saying. In a circular society where we lack text and we lack textual analysis, it means that we rely on cyclical patterns of the land around us and on oral traditions that are completely adaptable and flexible because knowledge that, that's no longer useful has to be discarded on a continuous basis in order to survive on the land, really. So we can't refer to a text that was written hundreds or thousands of years ago for inspiration and guidance and, you know, as a model in terms of how to live our lives as one that people we, we rely on our oral traditions and our, on our knowledge of the patterns, cycl cyclical patterns that play out in the environment on the land. And so this is accumulated through experiential learning over centuries and even millennia, of course. Elders have such a special role because in cultures that lack texts, whether they be religious texts and, and documents or scientific texts, elders are really like our living encyclopedias or our living storybooks or a living Bible, even, if you will. So, you know, we often hear about the important role of elders in Indigenous cultures, but it's rarely articulated in such a manner, you know, that it's clear to understand just why do they have such high importance in our cultures. And it's not just because they're older than the rest of us. Uh, it's because they are literally our encyclopedias. There are science teachers, our storybooks, um, and really, even you can call them like a living Bible in terms of spiritual teachings and the inf inspiration and guidance that we get from them uh, growing up and in our adult years as well. I want to shift my focus to the origin of the concept of rights. I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, rights are often thought of as fundamental to civilization, right? I'm sure we can all agree as people living in a Western democracy like Canada. Rights are regarded as pillars of society and culture, and uh, we enjoy a number of different rights in a democratic society like Canada. The problem with rights-based thinking is that it's had shifting meanings in European societies through the centuries. So um, let me name some examples here. So there's been the divine right of kings to rule, which permitted absolute power over subjects and did not leave a lot of room for many rights for the subjects themselves, of course. Uh, in contrast, there's been more modern conceptions of rights that have often emphasized liberty and equality as uh, the most important aspects of rights, really, as was evident in the American and French revolutions. And so the post-American and French revolution concept of rights has to do with protecting lower subjugated classes like peasants and serfs, et cetera, from stronger groups, in, case, uh, in this case, the royalty. So this is a completely different cultural history and historical trajectory of a culture that originated and developed in a land very far away from the Americas. When you talk to indigenous people, traditional indigenous people all across the Americas, you won't hear many mentions of the word rights. What you do hear is responsibility. The word rights and the entire concept related to rights is or was historically foreign to the peoples of the Americas. You know? So of course now we need uh, rights and we need to have our rights represented and also uh, in terms of our territorial and land governance issues, we do benefit from having rights, of course. I'm not saying we should do away with that concept or that it's not useful anymore. Of course it is useful, but I'm teaching you about the true essence of indigenous thinking, you know, indigenous land-based thinking in which the focus is on responsibility rather than, than rights, which is a concept that was and still is foreign to many of us here in the Americas. So in terms of building the nation of Canada and creating the Canadian identity, this really meant erasing the Indigenous cultural presence and our relationship with our Yetenoha. So this nation building process was based on a narrow economistic or linear, as I've been describing, conception of development and progress, and also no understanding that these were landscapes here in Southern Ontario and across Canada that were actively managed for millennia by Indigenous peoples. Natives 
in these historical accounts written by surveyors and other colonial agents were seen as simply part of nature, uh, not like a rational human being, but somewhere in between a human being and an animal or a plant, you know, something that's just part of nature, like an animal or a tree. Then there was, of course, this expansion westward through the years in the 1800s and a number of dubious treaties uh, that were brokered between the colonial government and various First Nations groups across Canada. And it was a nation that was built on resource, resource exploitation and on the notion of conquering and subduing this wild and untamed wilderness in order to build you know, a progressive society uh, and to have dominion over uh, this wild and untamed wilderness that was all around in Canada when the first European colonizers arrived. And so entire indigenous communities and cultural landscapes were thus written off by colonial surveyors. And then, of course, there was a process and policies of deculturation and assimilation, which is really not the focus of my discussion today. But uh, if you're not aware of these topics, I strongly uh, suggest you look at the work of some Indigenous scholars who are bringing light to these issues, but this is not the focus of my presentation. So there's a poem by my father, George Siwi, written in 1995 during an election year that really speaks to uh, this one dot perspective on the so-called Canadian nation building process and the Canadian identity. So the poem goes, the Canadians have won again. They're gonna be liber liberal, they're gonna be conservative, they're going to reform, they're going to democratize, they're going to be sovereign, they're going to be independent, they're going to develop Canada, they're going to transform her into money, jobs. Uh, Canada is still rich, very rich, they say. One day she will be poor, dirtied up, exhausted, sick, unhappy. The Canadians will no longer be able to win, nor be liberal, or conservative, or democratize, or reform, or be sovereign, or independent? Will there then remain someone enamored of the wonderful motherland, our Yatenoha, strangers once named Canada? You know, so this really goes to show you uh, what a one dot perspective on Canadian politics and the Canadian identity looks like. We consider that the current social structures around us in our current society are the products of linear thinking. So current social structures make us lose our sensitivity, sensitivity to the only thing to which we can tangibly and observably belong, which is the land, Yatenoha. Individualism and rights-based notions as guiding principles of society obfuscate physical realities and also biological truths uh, is what it boils down to, really. So growing up and living within our present social structures, people are systematically made to lose their innate sensitivity for life in its myriad expressions and forms. The spiritual dimension gets to be abandoned and forgotten in this kind of system and in these kinds of structures. The human society and the human community gets dissolved. The individual is now the center. Value is placed on the material. The sacredness of each being as part of the universal sacred circle of relations is now irrelevant in the great individualistic free-for-all, transforming everything and anything into money and personal power, which will always end up in the concentrated, or sorry, which will always end up concentrated in the hands of a very select few. And so the circle, as I've been explaining throughout my presentation, we consider is the woman's domain. The woman should be at the center of our circle. And so of course that kind of consciousness gets lost in these, this kind of society, this kind of modern rights-based society that I've been describing. Some other problems with Western leadership structures are that economic and political models are rooted in the domination of nature and women for that matter, because they're one and the same, according to the one dot mind. And this is a product of linear thinking. The central role of women is diminished and erased, and the role of women in society becomes secondary in this kind of order. Now, of course, we're encountering a host of environmental issues, land-based issues uh, that have a magnitude and breadth that we've never seen before, really, due to the ever-growing interconnectedness and interdependence of all peoples all around the world. 
as a result, new approaches have to be considered in order to deal with these problems and to create viable, holistic, and comprehensive solutions. You know, there's a new way of thinking that is needed in order to develop these solutions. And so we've been evolving toward concepts such as ethical extensionism in Western culture, the precautionary principle, sustainable development, animal rights, the rights of mother nature, so on and so forth. These are concepts that are considered new in Western cultures, but that in fact have very deep, very profound roots here in the American soil, in the indigenous American soil, and would hardly be considered new or revolutionary ideas by indigenous people. So trying to see how much time I've left. I think I'm still okay. Very frequently in many parts of the entire American continent in the Americas, the circle is divided into four quarters representing the four sacred directions, the four main elements in nature, and the four dimensions of the human family, namely the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual, as well as many other realities as perceived according to the general continental indigenous cosmovision. You know, whether you're um, talking to a Wanda person or a Maya person or a Dene person in the Northwest Territories, you'll get some kind of version of, of this general understanding and cosmovision which is land-based and responsibility-based. So we have to concentrate on how we can use our particular gifts, whether you're indigenous or non-indigenous, and also your particular vision to mend the world and make it better for everyone. You know, that's how we begin to talk about reconciliation, you know, is reconciliation with our yetenoha, as I'll explain in just a second. So daily, our elders say to us that our earth mother is suffering we all know already that uh, the earth is undergoing an increasingly rapid process of destruction and change through actions that are a result of linear thinking. So I'm speaking here of wise and old human beings in this context, indigenous of many nations who sometimes um, tell us about these changes that are going on and they feel the pain of our earth mother as well, as well as the animal peoples, the bird peoples, the fish peoples, plant peoples, and others. You know, So there's increasing awareness across the uh, continent in North and South America of these rapid changes that are going on and the dissolution of traditional indigenous societies, as well as our languages and knowledge systems. So we hear the voice of the earth and we know with mind and heart as indigenous people that she is speaking because she says the same things through the voices of every one of these men and women across the continent. So I'm going to wrap up my presentation in the next uh, couple of minutes, and I want to get at the heart of the matter, which is reconciling with our yatenoha and learning to belong to the land, which is to me what it means to be truly and deeply Canadian. So we've all learned to accept the notion that we belong to and are a part of Canadian society and also that we belong to the Canadian nation, an, imaginal, an imagined political entity with roots in the domination of nature and the sub subjugation of the land's original civilizations and peoples. If Canadians have come to take for granted that they belong to this philosophical construction, which is the Canadian political state, then it shouldn't be that much of a leap to be able to relearn that they belong to their yatenoha, which is the land, which is something that's concrete and real, which sustains them day to day and on which they depend and live much like a baby depends on their mother for sustenance, education, and for emotional and, and spiritual nourishment. We must learn to recognize that the only material, concrete, tangible and real society to which we can belong is the great circle of peoples on our yatenoha, including human and other than human peoples. Everything else exists only in our minds. It is ethereal, it is immaterial and fleeting, as well as uh, transitory, which is the Canadian nation and state, again, ever fleeting, subject to the whim of the political ordre du jour. The land, on the other hand, will be here forever and we will forever be dependent on her 
and looking to her for inspiration and guidance, just as a child looks to his mother or her mother for instruction and support. So Yatenoha is our first mother. The land is our first mother. And this is just as true for Wandat people as it is for all Indigenous nations and non-Indigenous people across Canada and the world for that matter. Wherever we're located in Canada, there is an Indigenous people or community whose language, culture, and worldview has developed and has been informed by the land in that place for millennia. They have learned to relate to the land in familial terms, like a daughter or son relates to their mother. So Canadians of all origins need to start, in the first instance, rec reconciling with their Yatenoha, the land on which they live and work. And so, of course, this necessitates learning. It's a learning process and learning journey for each individual, uh, and it requires consultation and relationship building and communication with the original civilizations of this land and their descendants, which still exist today. And so this is what is needed in terms of a first step toward reconciling and reconciliation. It's to reconcile with our first mother, uh, which is a mother that unites us all, as I was describing earlier. That's why I believe it begins with reconciling with our Yatenoha and accepting that she is our first mother. And in that way, this gives us as Indigenous people our rightful role as stewards of the land and, and, and educators as well, in which we can ed educate society in the future on these issues and themes. We're all born able to see the world in indigenous ways. You know, we're, every single human baby is born with that capacity. All babies and children are born to see the world in indigenous ways and to be able to sense the relationships that exist between all peoples, human and other than human. So a good thought exercise for each and every one of you um, attending my lecture tonight would be to reflect on how did you personally lose this ability? You know, Reflect on how through your socialization and education from your infancy into childhood and then adolescence and ultimately adulthood, how did you lose to how did you lose this ability to see the world in an indigenous way, in a responsibility-based way, and to understand that your Yatenoha is your first mother? We acquire volumes of information throughout our lifetime. Uh, I mean, I can speak for myself as an academic. I read tons of books and articles uh, from Western perspectives, indigenous perspectives, but we're very quick to lose our sense of relationships and really the true meaning of what sustains us, you know, our, the true meaning of our Yatenoha and what this means in terms of our survival as the human people and all other peoples. And so I want to leave you with that thought, you know, in terms of, I want you to reflect on how once you were able to see the world in such a way and what happened throughout the course of your life up until the present that led you to forget about this, you know, that led you to lose that, that sacred, that spiritual sense and, and really the reality that the land sustains us. We can only be belong to the society as it plays out on the land between the human and other than human peoples. That's something that's concrete and real and tangible, you know. So if we take for granted that we're Canadians and we belong to the Canadian state, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, and if, if that's what you want to think, that's fine, and I have no problem with that. But we, for that matter, I mean, we should also be capable of understanding that we belong to a greater society that's rooted in our Yatenoha, uh, which is material and real and concrete and which actually sustains us and we can, we can sense with our five senses. So that's, I think, where I'll, I'll leave you. Hopefully we have a bit of time for uh, some questions if you want to learn more about the one dot way of thinking and how I applied that in my relationships with the Yucatec Maya people, my brothers and sisters there, I have a book that was recently published titled Indigenous Geographies in the Yucatan, Learning from the Responsibility-Based Maya Environmental Ethos. So Tiawank and Esconian, thank you and I'll see you again. Maybe I'll stop sharing my slides. Oh, I can't, I can't hear anyone. Oh, I'm here now. <laughs> okay. 
Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Siri. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maria Patrico, and I'm the manager of branches at the Milton Public Library. We are happy to begin the facilitate, facilitated question and answer. I do see there's a couple of questions already, but if you have anything you'd like to ask, uh, please drop a question in the Ask a Question tab on the bottom of your screen. So I'll, um, I'll get this started. Uh, so one of the attendees has asked, um, do you think Canada's Indigenous communities are reluctant to identify with the settlers community, settler communities and um, the experiences they've had, uh, the Indigenous ancestors and the experiences they've had? So are Canada's Indigenous communities reluctant to identify with settler communities? Is that Correct. the question? That seems to be the question. I think that's that generally is the case. I think that is unfortunately generally the case. Uh, and I think that it's also understandable given the circumstances of what happened here on uh, the American soil here in present day Canada and all across really the world when we think about uh, these colonial power dynamics that manifested uh, in, in indigenous territories. So I think that yes, many indigenous peoples across Canada have difficulty establishing relationships with, I don't like using the word settler Canadians. I'll, I'll just say that uh, first of all. I think that it creates divisions between peoples who are all united by our, our Yetenoha. And uh, I think that maybe that's one of the, the roots of, uh, or that's at the root of the issue that we create these vocabularies and these terminologies that isolate people from one another in an abstract sense. Whereas instead of I'm a one dot person. I, I learned to see the world in a circular fashion and people can use the terms, the terminologies and vocabularies that they want. You know, everyone is on their own healing process and healing journey. I'm not here to say that my vision is the universal truth that I, that I speak for all indigenous peoples across Canada and the world. That's definitely not the case. I'm talking to you and I'm, I'm teaching you about what I learned from my ancestors, you know, from this tradition that developed here in Southern Ontario for a millennia and that we were able to maintain and preserve through centuries of turmoil and upheaval, you know, so I might use a different approach. I use a bridge building approach. My name is Sastaretsi. I'm the one who extends the rafters of our great longhouse, our great one that civilization to other peoples, you know, both indigenous and non-indigenous. And I can't speak for other people, but I think that using these terminologies and the, these vocabularies that isolate different peoples from one another, uh, I, I just don't see how that can lead to a fruitful dialogue and to a relationship, you know, built on maturity and, and trust and peace and diplomacy, especially. So, I, I mean, I'm sorry I don't have a more complete or comprehensive answer for you, but... Uh, to answer your questions, yes, there are many Indigenous people who uh, are reluctant to establish these relationships, and for good reason, as I mentioned, you know, given everything that's happened to them in the past, who can blame them, really? Who can who can blame Indigenous peoples, right? So that's my answer. Thank you. And um, there's another one. Uh, oh, they keep jumping. Uh, did the Wendat people have a relationship with the Métis of the prairies? Yes, uh, relationship with the Métis of the Prairies. Yes, actually, I believe it was my my great, yes, my great grandmother was in some way, according to my, you know, my family history, the oral tradition was related to Gabriel Dumont, uh, who was, was, of course, a very prominent Métis leaders, uh, leader in, uh, in the Red River Rebellion and, um, you know, with Louis Riel. Um, so, I mean, related... Uh, culturally is, is is that the question if we were related culturally or because definitely not culturally culturally we had the one that people have always had this tradition this one that culture that has followed us you know since time immemorial whereas the Métis are a distinct group that have their own culture combining western people's traditions and indigenous traditions you know but um, even though I I look this way and uh, and you know I, I, the only way I know is the one that way. That's how I was born and raised. That's how I've come to understand the world, you know. So um, I have deep respect for 
my Métis relatives, and uh, we're all on the same journey, you know. But uh, to say that we're culturally related uh, would would not be not be true. I'm not sure if that was the the sense of the question, though. So. There wasn't more detail to it, but let me just see if there's more here. Um, oh, there's a new question here. Um, Indigenous people's epistemology was taken away through assimilation. Why do Indigenous academic students have to prove their ontological ways? Is that changing in academic institutions today? And what is your perspective when Indigenous ways will be fully accepted? Hmm. That's a very, a loaded very good one question. for you. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good question. You know, I, mm -hmm. I came up as a, an Indigenous scholar and I was of course, I had my my father and my grandmother as mentors. You know, they they did their PhD, so I'm a third generation PhD in my family, which is to me uh, incredible in, in the indigenous context. You know, and not in a good way, but in a bad way. Um, and I was trained and I was educated by non-indigenous people throughout my my you know my university experience, uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD. I had non-indigenous supervisors. And I was maybe fortunate because it seemed that I began my journey uh, in the mid 2000s when I think things were beginning to change. There was a, a bit more openness to different life ways and perspectives and even indigenous knowledges. And I think that I'm very encouraged as an indigenous uh, academic today to find that there's a little bit more openness you know, to indigenous perspectives and worldviews. My department, has allowed me to create two courses related to indigenous environmental knowledge. And um, I can't speak for all universities and, and departments and programs, but I think that generally the case is that there's more openness and inclusiveness uh, in academic institutions. And of course, there's many, many problems and there's things are far from being perfect. Uh, I'm not in any way, shape, or form, suggesting that the problem has been solved and we're all happy and we can all, you know, uh, go home and laugh about it. Um, that's definitely not the case. But I think that things are changing somewhat slowly, but they are changing, and I'm very encouraged to see that. I have an Indigenous PhD student who, I think, is here tonight. She might not be here, but um, so to me, it's incredibly rewarding to be able to teach the next generation of Indigenous academics and, and geographers. So I think that things have changed since my father's generation, being the first Indigenous PhD in history in the history of Canada at Laval University against, you know, a committee and a supervisor of, um, of, of people who had deep, deeply entrenched French patriarchal Eurocentric values and who tried to get my father to stop at every step of the way in his PhD process, you know, actively discouraging him and trying to get him to quit his program. So things have, I think have changed since then, at least in, in my experience. I, I just saw uh, Jenna say she is here. <laughs> is it Gina, a, yes. I'm sorry, Gina, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, yes. Hi, Gina. See. And that was Gina's question, actually. So, um, oh, okay. Wow. Okay. I hope <laughs> I hope uh, that was an all right answer, Gina. I hope that reflects your your experience as well. Uh, it'd be nice to hear from Gina. But um, there's another one. And um, are you still okay with time here? It's I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. I'm okay. Um, yeah. How can we reconcile indigenous knowledges? with legal rights-based approaches to protecting the environment? How can a legal rights-based framework incorporate indigenous perspectives of land responsibility? Mm -hmm. I think that ultimately it's our Yatenoha, it's our earth mother who will spark this change. And it's indigenous peoples like me and many, many others, indigenous scholars and scientists and leaders, you know, and uh, legal experts who are actively trying to demonstrate the value and the currency of our indigenous knowledges because we feel that it has so much to bring to the rest of the world you know and it can change the established order once things get to a critical point people will be looking for models and solutions you know people will be clamoring for solutions you know trying to find solutions and what do we have here in the americas we have uh, peoples, you know, thousands or at least several hundreds of peoples still today 
uh, that practice their traditions, that have been able to maintain their sacred cultural knowledges through so much change and um, and destruction that was um, that that occurred, you know, on their traditional territories and that was uh, exacted on their peoples by colonial forces. But ultimately, I'll speak for myself. My mission and my goal is to demonstrate the present day value and currency of indigenous knowledge, especially indigenous land-based knowledge, because that's my field. And I think that once we're able to demonstrate that to a, a broader degree and to a multitude of different people, you know, where it's not a guilt-driven drive to respect indigenous peoples and to reconcile, such as the one that is really the, the leading approach now is, oh, you know, we feel bad for Indigenous peoples. We did a lot of bad things to them. So now I feel guilty. And uh, now I feel like reaching out to them because I, I hope they forgive me. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a settler Canadian. Please forgive me. You know, that's, that's kind of the approach that I see these days. But I think that once we demonstrate the true meaning and value of Indigenous knowledge and that Canadians, millions of Canadians are able to see that tangibly and concretely through, through our research, through our work, through our ideas and knowledge, that this will lead to a transformative change in society and it will lead um, more and more institutions and these legal rights-based structures to incorporate and adopt principles and perspectives that, that are very much in line with indigenous knowledge systems. So I think that that will be the turning point. Thank you. Um, that was our final question. And um, I was very inspired. I've never heard of Yetanoha, and I'm really looking forward to reading more and learning more. So uh, thank you so much on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, the town of Milton, the Milton Public Library. Thank you, Dr. Siwi, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Um, thank you also to all the attendees for joining us. Um, there will be a copy of tonight's lecture available on the Milton Public Library website in the next few days, as well as previous lectures, as well as on YouTube. Um, and our next Laurier Milton lecture will be on April 14th, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Can I say something in closing? Yes, please. Yes. So, Tia Wang, thank you, everyone. You're all my relatives through Ariatenoha, and I love all of you. So, Eskonyan. Thank you. Thank you so much.